Good afternoon. My name is Jan Roller. I'm a former president of the City Club of Cleveland. It's a great honor that we welcome our speaker today, Nancy Pelosi, the current Democratic leader of the House of Representatives of the 113th Congress. Her legislative accomplishments have been many, but she is most noted for the fact that she is the first woman to be elected Speaker of the House, the highest the highest elected office held by a woman in the United States thus far. <laughs> Upon accepting the gavel as the 60th speaker, she stated, for our daughters and our granddaughters, today we have broken the marble ceiling. It is a moment for which we have waited over 200 years. Never losing faith, we waited through the many years of struggle to achieve our rights. Ms. Pelosi served as speaker from 2007 to 2011. She is also the first Californian, the first Italian American, and the first woman in American history <laughs> to lead a major political party in Congress. Her political work career started long before. She was born in Baltimore into a politically active family, attended Trinity College, and moved to San Francisco with her husband Paul in 1969. She worked her way up in democratic politics in California and first was elected to the U.S. House from San Francisco in 1987. Congresswoman Pelosi's accomplishments as speaker have been recognized not just by Democrats. Norman Ornstein, a longtime observer of Congress and politics, who spoke here just recently and who is a resident scholar at the conservative American Enterprise Institute, said of Ms. Pelosi's work, we're looking at an extraordinary set of accomplishments over a brief period of time. She ranks with the most consequential speakers certainly in the last 75 years. Despite being faced, <laughs> despite being faced with a divided house along party lines while she was speaker, the Congress passed health care reform, financial reform, ethics reform, the repeal of don't ask, don't tell, a $787 billion stimulus, an extension of health care coverage to 11 million children, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, a minimum wage increase, and student aid. She has been a powerful voice for civil rights and human rights around the world for decades. Today, we're fortunate to have with us our own Connie Schultz. A Pulitzer Prize winning journalist to engage Ms. Pelosi in a discussion which will be followed by our traditional City Club question and answer period. Connie continues her impressive body of work today as an author and syndicated columnist. She writes a column called Views for Parade Magazine and is currently working on a novel about a working class family from Ohio. <laughs> Connie, now I'd like to turn the program over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I am so proud to be part of this packed room for the City Club program. Last October, Nancy, I shared the stage with Gloria Steinem and in Connecticut, at the Connecticut Forum, and I remember thinking at the time I was with the woman who had made it possible to dream, and today I'm sharing the stage with the dream come true. It's so wonderful to share the stage with you today. So I'm gonna look at the clock and make sure I stay on track, and let's get started. Um, yesterday, I watched your speech last night, you spoke about was more than 650 people. Is that right, Chris? With the Democratic, uh, Stewart. Stewart, yes. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. And then Stuart Garson. I didn't see you there. Um, one of the things that was clear to me that you wanted to talk about at length and with passion is the growing income disparity in the United States. And I'm wondering, um, first of all, when when did this become a primary issue for you? Am I correct that it is at this point? Uh, well, yes, it, it is, Connie. Thank you uh, for uh, referencing what I was talking about last evening. Before I respond to you, though, I want to uh, thank uh, the City Club of Cleveland for the hospitality extended to me today. But more important than that, your leadership for freedom of speech over 100 years. Congratulations on that. I'm <laughs> I am uh, honored to be here as, as part of, of the uh, Stephen Minter what are we calling it, Endowed Forum. Stephen and his wife Dolly are here. Thank you, I'm honored to be part of that. Jan, thank you for your kind 
words of introduction. My invitation came from my colleague, a leader in the Congress, Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur, who's a great leader uh, in the Congress. I'm so proud we're also joined by another great leader, and he's the head of our 30-somethings in the Congress, <laughs> Congressman Tim Ryan, and I'll talk more about both of them. And we take great pride, uh, we take pride, uh, great pride in Sherrod Brown because he's, I don't know where he started, but he started in Washington in the House of Representatives, so every day we take pride in his being such a great fighter for the middle class in our country. <laughs> And I know that's a pride that we share with Connie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Connie, for all of your work uh, on issues that relate to fairness and opportunity in our country. Uh, you, you, you have been so widely recognized for it. So I feel a little humble talking about it in front of you, but here, here it goes. I think you can handle this. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for your time. But I, I know, uh, well, uh, you and Cher then, Leslie, and Marcy and Tim. I'm very concerned about, uh, first let me pre uh, thank Stuart uh, Garson for his invitation also to be there last night with so many great Democrats, if I be me allowed a, a partisan word here, and to be with Chris as well, the chair of, of the state party, as well as the chair of the Cuyahoga County Party, two of people so responsible for the re-election of Barack Obama with Ohio in the, in the blue column. Okay, that's for the politics. Now, now, for why we are all involved in politics, you know, what is the point? Uh, and the point is, is to really honor the vows of our founders. Uh, they were such creative thinkers, and, and they, uh, as people study, like Toynbee and others who study civilization, say the beginning of a great civilization, a country, whatever, begins with leaders who are uh, a part of a creative when I say minority, I don't mean minority of the people, but minority because there are fewer people in the governing, the governing few, and that they are, are part of a, a creative minority. A, a, min a, a civilization, an economy, a society, a country starts to weaken when the few are become an exploitive minority. We're more concerned about, instead of using power uh, for the civilization to flower, uh, they use power to consolidate their own power and wealth. And does that sound a little bit familiar to you? Well, we are a great country, and we can withstand just about anything. But we do have to recognize that we do have challenges. The middle class is the backbone of a, a democracy. Louis Brandeis said, you can have wealth in the hands of the very few, or you can have a democracy. It's hard to have both. In fact, he said, you can't have both. So this middle class has been really recognized as the central force for the common good for a long time. And I just use this quote so that I have it exact. No less a person no longer ago than Aristotle said, it is manifest that the best political community is formed by citizens of the middle class and that those states that are likely to be well administered are those in which the middle class is large and strong. And what I talked about last evening, and I want to just uh, address now, is the, the threat, the challenges, I would say challenges to the middle class that I see that are out there are the income disparity that has been growing in our country. I think another challenge is the education disparity that is in our country, and another challenge is the role of money, the role of money in political campaigns that weakens the voice of the many. Being true to the vows of our founders, they sacrificed their lives, their liberty, their sacred honor for government of the many, not the government of the money. And so we have to, we have to change that, and I think that we can. The only thing is we have to raise money to win the election in order to change it, so. <laughs> but in any case, to getting back to your point about income disparities, sometime in about the 70s, you can look back and you can see and you can watch the numbers in Ohio. And I, I just got some off the internet today, but shows the numbers uh, in Ohio. Uh, but go back to the 70s and you will see uh, a growth in our economy. Well, you know, in the post-war, the boom of our, uh, of our economy was largely uh, because of a, a trained, uh, skilled workforce that contributed to the economic success of our country and that it was recognized. 
So then you come to the 70s, where up until now we have CEO income, productivity, and if I had a third hand, middle income uh, uh, wage earners, the workers. And so they were all sort of together. Then all of a sudden, the CEOs started going like this. Productivity increased. Middle income, middle income income just leveled off. And that is what has happened. There's this Jaws effect, this gaping, open diversity. And I'm going to read another quote to you, because I think one of the reasons why uh, is um, reflected in this quote. At the, it was by the head then of Standard Oil of New Jersey, Frank Abrams, chairman of Standard Oil of New Jersey, on what he called stakeholder capitalism. The job of management is to maintain an equitable and working balance among the claims of the various directly affected interest groups, stockholders, employees, customers, and the public at large. That was the attitude stakeholder capitalism. We then moved on, coming out of that period, into shareholder capitalism, where it was only about the bottom line and quarterly reports. And that's what meant something on Wall Street that sent the CEO, uh, based on that quarterly report, that disparity. With, even though productivity is increasing, no recognition that workers played a part in making that happen. And that income disparity, with all that goes with it, in terms of opportunities for families, and, and pensions, uh, uh, the security that people will think they'll have in their later years so they can invest in their families, and the future. It's always about the future. That's why when I got sworn in, I talked about the children and the future. So it, it is, uh, it's something that if we undermine the middle class by having this income disparity, we are hurting our own <coughs> democracy. And the only thing I think that we can do about it is to change the minds of those who are elected officials, who at the same time as we're talking about this, are talking about instead of uh, incentives uh, to make it in America, to create jobs here, and to recognize we're the most productive workforce in the world, is to give tax incentives to send jobs overseas. <coughs> it's the same people who say these, uh, we shouldn't tax all this wealth. Now, we, we applaud wealth. We applaud achievement. God bless you for that. But what we are concerned about is that there's not any shared recognition of how that wealth was created. And so if you have a situation where we don't want to, uh, we, we want to exploit the work, exploit the capital, if we want to exploit the worker, uh, get these big pets, not don't tax it. But uh, by the way, we have to reduce the deficit. So we probably should cut education. We probably should cut Meals on Wheels. We probably should not. And, they st and they're the same people who fight an increase in the minimum wage. It's just not fair. Um, it's just not fair. So uh, maybe it took a long time. That's OK, because I'm, I'm, it's. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and YC Cab, oh, no, I say YC Cab, right, do I introduce? Mary Rose. Mary Rose Okar is here, too, our former colleague. <laughs> Nancy, um, here in Ohio, both in the, in the presidential race in 2008 and in 2012, you, were, you played a starring role uh, oh, in oh. some of the worst ads that yeah. ran on television. <laughs> uh, Thank you. And a lot of them, <laughs> and in the mailings. And I, I don't recall a period since Newt Gingrich was Speaker of the House where a congressional leader was such a primary player in mm. terms of uh, negative ads in a campaign. I wonder what you make of that. Why well, did that happen? Well, I, I think it's because uh, House Democrats were so effective. What uh, was about you? Well, they had to personalize it. They had to personalize it. I think they must have spent about um, 100,000, I mean, 100 million dollars against me as, the, as the, uh, the personification of the change that we brought in there. Now, you remember when we decided, when the president said he wanted to do health care reform, well, some of us had been working on that for decades, for a long time. But we knew that we were going up against insurance industry. We were going up against uh, the um, anti-government ideologues who didn't want to see any government role at all there, don't even believe in Medicare Medicaid, and Medicaid and Social Security. Uh, and uh, that uh, at the same time, we 
re, uh, instituted our Wall Street reform, so uh, we challenged big oil in terms of subsidies and the rest of that, in terms of, of uh, wanting renewables to keep our air clean, keep us number one innovatively in the green technologies in the world. We took on some really big interests. But these ads that I'm referring to were pretty personal <laughs> no, that, well, and, and that's to your politics. And I'm wondering, yeah. I, I guess one of the questions I would have well, is... Well, I'm just telling you where the money came from for okay. the ads. How did it feel personally to be... I felt that it would not have been effect attacking me unless I had been effective. Uh, I, I, I didn't like it for... Uh, <laughs> And they, I mean, look, they don't even want to work with the President of the United States. He happens to have spent hundreds of millions of dollars so people know him. That, that nobody knew who I was, so they could paint any picture they wanted. But let me tell you what's important about that. I have has had, and, and, and Marcy and Mary Rose were part of this as well, and other members of Congress, we have tried to encourage women uh, to, to run for office. And it's not for the faint of heart. I mean, on the easiest of days, uh, the easiest of days, uh, you know, you, you put yourself on the line. And you have to compete in the world of ideas and, in, and political organizing and all of that, fundraising. But if you, when I talk to these young women and I say, look, I came after my kids were raised, come in younger so that you can gain seniority sooner, have standing on the issues internationally and nationally, and in your communities first and foremost. And they see that, they say, well, you know, I, I, I believe that I have something that I can offer. I, I really have the interest in doing it. I, I'm calling to public service, but I don't know if I can put my family to millions of dollars spent mischaracterizing me so that my neighbors don't even recognize me on the street. I, I don't know if I can take that. What do you tell them? And that would apply to men as well. But the, with women, it's, it's uh, you know, we're, we're trying to get more women to run. I just say, you know what, it's all worth it. Uh, our, our democracy needs many more women in every aspect, whether it's government and politics, whether it's our national security, whether it's the academic world, whether it's the health field, the corporate world, whatever it happens to be. All of it will be vastly improved by the increased participation and leadership of women. And, um, and, and everybody has to make a personal decision about how it affects them. I mean, if your children come home crying from school, or in my case, your grandchildren, because of what people are saying about your mother, especially your mother, your grandmother, that's a little removed. Your mother, I mean, that's a hard thing, right? I mean, that's a hard thing for a family to take because you know, people repeat what they hear and the rest, and, and so, so it's hard, but it's also necessary. There's such an urgent need, and that's why I want to, I promise you this, political promise, absolutely. If you reduce the role of money in politics and increase the level of civility in politics, you will have many more women, young people, minorities elected to public office. It will happen. So what happened? Can we talk a little bit about how you got into politics? Are you, are you familiar, I assume, at least you know that Sheryl Sandberg has written a book yeah. called Lean In. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's been a lot of debate around the uh, issue of children and women and when yeah. they should have children and should they put their careers on hold even temporarily or, or do, you know, just draw back a bit when their children are young. And she seems to really be encouraging women to, to that you've got to plow through yeah, it. Yeah. You did it very differently. And I well, wonder I if you could talk about era. that. I, I mean, I've been, uh, I've been to Cheryl's sessions at her home on, on this, and I admire uh, her, how successful she is and what she has done. But every woman has to choose her own path. I say the best path for you is your path. You choose it. Nobody can say, you should stay home longer or you should go out sooner. I mean, God bless her for the encouragement, and that, that's, that's important. And I think all the words that women, uh, these successful women, high profile, are saying have value. But what has value to you is your own situation, and that's the best path. For me and another generation, you know, I, I had my children, five children, I brought my baby home the fifth child, Alexandra, our filmmaker, when I brought her home from, <laughs> fifth mom, brought her home from the <laughs> hospital that week, our oldest daughter, Nancy, was turning six, and she was the fifth child. So we were into the program. <laughs> <laughs> of course,
according to canon law. <laughs> In any event, um, and so I never had, a, and I was mentioning this to Connie earlier, I, I, I wrote a book called Know Your Power just to, to explain to people how I fell into a good thing, actually. I mean, here's what it was. I mean, I was raised in a political family. My, when I was born, my father, Thomas D'Alessandro Jr., he was the congressman from Baltimore to Washington. Okay. Came home every night, Baltimore. When I was in first grade, he became the mayor of Baltimore, first Catholic mayor of Baltimore. And when I went away to college, he was still the mayor of Baltimore. So that was the life we led. And it was great, and it was wonderful. And it was um, uh, that public service was a noble calling, that we all had responsibilities to each other, uh, and, and that. But I never intended to be, I was the shy one. I, you know, I was in the 50s, rock and roll. Elvis, you know, that, that was sort of where I was operating. And so people say, oh, she always wanted to be in politics. No, I really wanted to be a little more normal in terms of what happens on weekends and the rest. You understand what I'm saying, right? So in any case, I get married. My dear husband's from San Francisco. We move there. We have all these kids, so we have a big house. A friend comes to see us and says, oh, you have a big house. We'll be having lots of democratic events here. <laughs> and so there we were, everybody who came to town flowed through our home, and then one thing and another, I was on the Library Commission, I chaired that, I became the chair of the California Democratic Party, we hosted the Democratic Convention, all of this with like an, I had reached my heights, I was the chair of the California Democratic Party, I mean that was so great. But anyway, then our congresswoman took ill and she was dying and she asked me to run for her seat. And so I went to my daughter, Alexandra, who was the only one home. She was going to be a senior in high school. And I said, Alexandra, mommy has this opportunity to run for Congress. Marcy's heard this story so many times, as is Tim. But uh, I, I, any decision is OK. If you, you know, I love my life, and I love being here with you. One more year would be better when she was in college. But, uh, but so I might not win. You know, it's just a chance to run. And she said, and I said it with the greatest sense I wanted to convey to her that I really didn't mind what the answer was. Either one would be perfect. She said, Mother, get a life. <laughs> <laughs> what? Because I explained to her I'd be gone like three nights a week. Why did a teenage girl would not want her mother gone? <laughs> of course, she's very close to my husband, and he's a good supervisor. So, uh, so I expanded my life. But I have to say that I was very, I never planned on it, but when the opportunity presented itself, I was very motivated because I viewed politics as my family had as an extension of our lives. And here we had these children, five children. They had every wonderful opportunity, especially love and attention and self-esteem and the rest. And I really thought every child should have that. So I viewed my for you and at my going into politics directly as an extension of my care of my own family. For me, it's always been about the children, the three most important issues facing the Congress, our children, our children, our children, and their future. So that's why I was so motivated, and that's why I say to these young women, what do you believe? What is inside of you? Because your contribution is the most, it is unique. There is nothing to compare to it. Only you can make that contribution based on your knowledge. You, first of all, your, your, your vision, your north star, what, do you, what guides you? Your, your knowledge, your judgment, what you've worked on that you think you can make a contribution, plan you might have to get the job done, boom, and how you convey that and how people are attracted to you. So it's a great thing, and we need many more women in the leadership in all aspects of our lives. So that's what I say to them is, my path, your path, the path that matters is the one that you choose in the realities of your own family. Because as any of you know who are raising, who have raised families, it's the most important job in the world. It, it, it takes attention. And everything just doesn't go, people get sick, people have challenges, there's economic situations for people. And uh, it, you know, it's, it needs your attention. 
Nancy, you made a, um, a reference, you were kind of joking about being Catholic and having all those children. However, um, my impression over the years of you has been that your faith does play a central role in your life as a liberal, as a yeah. Democrat. Um, I noticed liberal. last night, Sharon and I couldn't find our seat last night, so we were actually standing behind you during the prayer. And I saw you quietly cross yourself when it was over. And I know for years you were in a faith and politics group right, with, with, Sharon. with Sharon. So yeah. I'm wondering, as a fellow liberal who I, I certainly have been attacked many times, how could I possibly be a Christian and be a liberal? I'd love if you would, please. <laughs> I'm not saying anybody here ever did that. Of course you did. But I certainly have gotten my share of mail reviews. I'm certain you have. And I wonder how you would respond to that. What role does well, faith does, play if, in your if, politics? If, 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 how can we say the Gospel of Matthew? It, 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 it says everything that Christ said when I was hungry, when I was homeless, when I was in prison. You visited me. That's why I was so happy His Holiness visited the prisoners to wash their feet, and women as well. I, I really... I'm very confident about the connection between the values I was raised in. Oh, let's go back there, Baltimore, Maryland, Little Italy, Italian-American community, christened in the Catholic Church, also in the Democratic Party. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> because the values were so identical, but nonetheless, ardent Catholics, uh, staunch Democrats, proud Italian-Americans, fiercely patriotic, loving America, and that com uh, the compatibility between what we were taught about our responsibilities, respecting the dignity and worth of every person, that there's a spark of divinity in every person, and that we had to honor that, and that God loves poor people in a very special way, and we have a responsibility uh, to lift them up and meet their needs. So to me, it is the most natural to be a, a, a Catholic and to be a liberal is just an extension of, of, my, of my faith. I don't like mixing religion and politics, you know, in terms of church and state, but certainly it is uh, my motivation and I'm very, very comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. um, I have to ask, when will we see the first woman president? As soon as Hillary decides she wants to run. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're right on the brink. I think we're right on the brink. Now, I didn't think you were going to answer it that directly. <laughs> well, the, thing is, is that the thing on these things, we have an expression, those who know don't tell and those who tell don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> I just hope. <laughs> I just hope. And I hope that she will run because um, I think it, we, it will send such an, well, first of all, she would be the best prepared person to enter the White House in every possible way. She's held every position. She's, she's seen firsthand as First Lady, but she's uh, acted uh, uh, so brilliantly as United States Senator, how proud we are as Secretary of State. So she has the fuller package than I've seen anybody have in a very, well, you know, I don't want to go to like Franklin Roosevelt or something, but let's say in modern history. And she is, uh, and with all due respect to all of the presidents that we have had, she's just spectacularly prepared. Uh, it's just a question of her personal decision, and that would, you know, hopefully that will come soon, and hopefully... How soon do you think she needs to make this decision? Because it's, it's clear... <laughs> I mean, I, I, many are waiting, right? They're, they're waiting to see what she's going to do, and she will clear the field, will she not? Or well, I think... Let, let me just say this, and then I think we're going to hear from the audience, right? Um, here's the thing. <laughs> yeah, two, you got two minutes. I don't want to get Hillary uh, unhappy about what I say about her timing, but, he, but here's the thing. I think what she's doing is exactly right. I mean, she's imagined traveling the whole world. I, I actually just got off the phone that so I was a little bit late speaking to Secretary Kerry. And I thought, well, I'll talk to him later. And then I thought, no, I can't talk to him later. He's in China. He's going to get on a plane. By the time, you know, everything is in the here and now when you're the Secretary of State. And so she needs time to do what she feels like doing, you know, just catching up. I think the, the longer she takes actually is kind of wholesome because it puts a hold on the presidential. I mean, we barely have finished the last election. They're talking about 2016. I'm saying, hey, wait a minute, we got 2014 in the middle here. So let's not, let's not, you know, you want to talk about too much politics. You know, let's, let's fight the fights we have on the issues that are important in the here and now. As we know, time will inevitably, inevitably pass. 
So, um, so her time, again, as I said about these young women getting it, whatever her timing is, that's the right timing. All right. Uh, Jan, you want to start with the announcements, and then we'll take um, questions from all of you? Okay. Some of you. <laughs> <laughs> Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a special forum featuring Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi, U.S. Representative for California's 12th District. We will return momentarily for our question and answer period after a few announcements. We encourage you to formulate questions for our speaker now and remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here and those streaming live. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. We are also delighted at all of uh, the corporations and nonprofit organizations who have purchased tables for today's event. Please see your printed program for a full listing of table sponsors and of the City Club's upcoming programs. And we thank you all for your support. Today's forum is the annual Steve and Dolly Minter Endowed Forum, made possible by a special gift in recognition of Steve Minter's public service as President and Executive Director of the Cleveland Foundation to the City Club Forum Foundation. Joining us at the head table today is Steve and Dolly Minter. Will, will you please stand and let us recognize you. And the City Club would like you all to remember Seth Taft, a great friend and supporter of the City Club who passed away yesterday. He uh, narrowly lost his bid for mayor of Cleveland in 1967 uh, when he was defeated by Carl Stokes. Seth led a full and wonderful life and he was 90 years old. Uh, now we would like to return to Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone members and guests alike. Holding the microphone today are Development Associate uh, Michael Cromaldi, over here, and Program Director Carrie Miller. So our first question, please. My question for you is that if we had open primaries because in, in throughout the country, would we have a better chance of having a better outcome in the political process and the Democratic Party doesn't seem to be very much involved, or in the, uh, maybe the wrong word, but they're not as strong in the states' um, assemblies rather than the Congress. Oh, thank you for your question. If you buy open primaries, you mean a free-for-all in the primary and the two top vote-getters go on to the general. Uh, our experience in California is, has not been a positive one with the open primary. It was thought that if you had the open primary, then all the uh, smaller parties would have a shot. But the fact is, you either end up with a Democrat and a Republican, or two Republicans, or two Democrats. And it's very costly because for us, and then in several cases, we ended up with two Democrats in the general election. So we had a primary, and then we had it all over again, instead of it be, uh, the, uh, one race or another lining it up as a, as a uh, bipartisan race, or as if it was a very, like a district like mine, would never, would never be a Republican elected there. So it would be over. So if you're trying to reduce the role of money, it doesn't do that. If you're trying to broaden the participation of smaller parties, it doesn't do that. So from our experience, I don't recommend it. I think that what we have to do is what we're prepared to do is to try to reduce the role of money in politics. I mean really take it way down so that you're empowering grassroots participation, you're uh, empowering small contributors, you're leveling the playing field so that many more people can participate and, and afford uh, or can reach out to small donors without having to worry about hundreds of millions of dollars uh, coming in. I think that that's a much more wholesome way to go if, that, if, if we want to achieve minor party <coughs> participation to a greater extent and reducing the role of money. When it comes to spending money in politics, I particularly approve of that when my phone rings and the politicians are calling me. There's been much written about the rules of the Senate and the House with a lot of criticisms about the failure to be able to move legislation along. What specific changes would you recommend to improve this? 
Well, now you have a number of, you had a comment about the phone ringing and uh, <laughs> at dinner time, no doubt. Uh, the, um, I, I guess I'll start with your last part of your, your question. How would we improve? It didn't used to be this way. Let's recognize that as we have seen the power of some who would have disparity in our country and who would not be addressing uh, the challenges f faced by uh, America's work middle class and those who aspire to the middle class, that you have a big difference in opinion in Congress. So while we may have rules that, that uh, in the Senate especially, in the House you, you take a vote, you take a vote. In the Senate you have to have 60 votes. And not, without going into their rules, because I have enough to do in the House of Representatives, and they sort of don't like people messing with their rules, do they, Jer Sherrod? <laughs> 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 so anyway, and then I may defer to Sherry on this. Here's the thing. When I was speaker and President Bush was the, the President of the United States, we didn't go over there and say, forget about it, never, does never work for you, that's the timing of when you're ever getting anything through Congress, or nothing, that's what you're going to accomplish with us. But that's their attitude toward President Obama. When President Bush was president, we passed many things. We, were, we fought him on the Iraq War. We fought him on trying to privatize Social Security. But where we could, we tried to work together. We passed the biggest energy bill in the history of our country. He wanted nuclear. I wanted renewables. We came together. We did the emission standards, cafe standards, so many things important to the environment, conservation, uh, uh, efficiency, and the rest. Uh, we passed the TARP bill. Who wanted to vote for TARP? You know, the TARP, which was the, uh, uh, we were told we were going to have a melt island in our financial industry unless we did this. The Republicans didn't vote for it because they don't believe in government. And so that, that was a government intervention. So we had to carry the day for that. That was a hard sell. We passed, though, with him a, a mental health parity bill. We passed one of the most progressive uh, tax bills in terms of making rebates refundable all the way down to the poorest people in our country. I mean, we try to find a common ground. And so when, when we and the president won and we had the majority and we accomplished some of the things that Jan talked about, we had done the minimum wage. We did that under President Bush. We did that under President Bush. He wasn't advocating for it, but he signed it. Um, and, and, um, and some other initiative. So when, pres so when we had, and then we did the Affordable Care Act, Wall Street Reform, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, Jan talked about some of those. We were very proud of all of that. But when President, when they won the majority, largely because they just all of a sudden, because of the Supreme Court decision, could pour hundreds of millions of dollars against the Democrats, me being one, I got my own hundred million to myself, 75 to 100 million. And I, I, I don't, you know, I think that's, wrong, but nonetheless it was there. Um, when they came in, their attitude toward the president, and they said it right out there. Our goal is to make sure he doesn't succeed. How could you say that? I mean, what arrogance tells you that you are elected to go to Washington and say, I don't want the president of the United States. You may disagree with him, you may fight him on issues, but to block every jobs bill at a time when he had inherited such a terrible economy to block every job initiative. That's Senator Mitch McConnell you're referring to. He's Senator, the, the leader yeah. of the Republicans right. in the Senate. So, so that's why it's that way. It comes back to a place where we have major disagreements. But that doesn't mean that you don't try to find common ground and to have results and solutions for the American people. President Washington, that's going back a while, not as far as Aristotle, but that's going back far. President Washington, when he left office, he cautioned against parties that would be at war with their own government. And so if you don't believe in government as, as, as the anti-government ideologues, many of whom are in the House of Representatives, don't, this is a perfect, you say, how could you block a jobs bill? Well, because it has a government role. How can you block this? How can you block that? because they don't believe in a government role. And so that's, we have a fundamental difference. And a lot of it is centered on who has the money in terms of, of uh, 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 allowing this disparity to happen 
because they fight an increase in the minimum wage and the rest of that. And again, tax benefits to send jobs overseas. Don't tax uh, those who don't make the wealthiest pay their fair share, but cut investments in education. The worst idea in the world, with stiff competition coming from them, mind you, but the worst. The, nothing brings more money to the Treasury than the education of the American people. Early childhood, thank you, President Obama, for putting a universal preschool in the budget, K through 12, college, higher education, post-grad, lifetime learning. Nothing brings more money to the Treasury. So you cut education, you're increasing the deficit. So in any case, we have strong differences. And the only way that it can change is if the public weighs in. And I don't necessarily even mean electorally. I mean just we make some of these issues so hot that the public can't handle it. And then, the, for example, we will have immigration reform in a matter of months, right, Sharon? In just a matter of months, we will have immigration reform because 70% of Hispanics voted Democratic. That was very eloquent to the Republicans. And the, uh, and the <laughs> Carrie? So I, 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 I violated one of the rules. It's supposed to be short questions. I assume that meant short answers. So. <laughs> Thank you for your question, sir. As a young woman who is interested in a life of public service such as yourself, as well as hoping to run for office one day, I am about to be a graduate of Kent State University. What piece of advice could you give to me to help me in my early stages of my career? Well, um, thank you for your interest in being part of public service in our country. It is a noble calling. And the, uh, just some of the fundamentals are really know what you care about. You, know, just, you can't just care. You have to be a dreamer with a plan. You, know, you have this vision. What's the plan? And the plan, it, it, whether you run yourself or you help others, or you um, just participate in, in party activities or civic groups or the rest, is uh, just to know if, if, if it's the environment, if it's women's rights, or whatever it happens to be, know your stuff so you can talk about it and you can follow it and you can know when people are going off the deep end on it and, and you can make your voice heard. The other part of it is, and, and this was really part of what I did, was I, I always, I, being a christened in the Democratic Party Democrat, always sort of wanted to help in, in elections and stuff, just as a volunteer. But I always did what I said I was going to do. Right, Mr. Chairman? I did what I said I was going to do. You can be relied upon. Don't say I'm going to blah, blah, blah. Say I'm going to do this much. If you do more, great. But if you can be relied upon, so that those, you're, you're professional, you're organized, that is to say professional in that, you take responsibility, you get the job done, you know what you're talking about, I guarantee you that you will attract people to you and they will want to lift you up. And that is from your vision that you care about, your knowledge of the subject, judgment you bring to it, your organizational skills to get the job done. Uh, it will be irresistible. Good luck to you. Thank you. Back there, Nancy. My name is Jose Feliciano. I, I'm Hispanic. <laughs> All right. So I, I want to follow up on your immigration comment and, and ask you to uh, use your crystal ball. Tell me what it is that's going to happen in the House of Representatives. Where are the elements? And uh, I'm assuming it's going to pass in the Senate, but I think the House is probably where the challenge is. So if you could comment on that, I'd be grateful. Uh, we have, I'll just tell you, from the standpoint of House Democrats and how, how I see that, we have for a long time had uh, our principles, which were that we would have comprehensive immigration reform, meaning the whole package would go together. Uh, that would include uh, uh, issues like securing our border, that's our sovereign right to do, secure our border, protect our workers. We do that by not exploiting workers coming in. Um, uh, family unification, a very important part of America's American dream. And, and a, third, a fourth um, um, path to legalization, which is a path to citizenship. And in all of those categories, we have the H-1B visas, all the visas that 
are, are uh, about attracting talent or keeping talent here that's been educated here. So those, are, I'm not giving you everything, but that's approximately some of the points of it. I think they're all in your bill in the Senate, aren't they, Sherry? They're all. And, and so the question is, you know, when did you have to be here to be on a path to legalization, that kind of thing. The, uh, we assume that the Senate will send a bill, and we hope that the House will take up that bill, because that's what can get 60 votes in the Senate. From what we hear about the Senate bill, it's a, uh, it has some components that have already produced compromises. Like I talked to um, one Friday to uh, uh, Richard Trumka about the, the AFL and the Chamber of Commerce coming to agreement. Nobody loves the, each of them love it to death, but it is a compromise, and that's what we go there to do. Uh, the uh, Arturo Rodriguez, I'm just naming names all over the place here. Arturo Rodriguez, he's the head of United Farm Workers. That was another piece of unfinished business. He called me on Saturday morning to say at 3 o'clock in the morning between Friday and Saturday that the uh, farm worker piece had been agreed to, and they were going to announce it like today. So don't tell anybody I told you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so those things are coming together. So we would hope to, um, to take up the bill. Uh, you never know what's going to happen on the House side. Some of them had 100. They had a group together and took a count. I don't know how you do this. And they said 120 of us don't have any Hispanics in our districts. Well, this bill's not just about Hispanics. It's about Hispanics. It's about Asian Americans. It's about African American people coming from the Caribbean, coming from Africa. It's about Europeans. It's about Australians. It's about everybody. But they have dis determined. Now, you know that can't possibly be true. But what if, you know, so what? You know, in other words, this is about the constant reinvigoration of America that immigration has always been. It's a mess right now. We can make it right. I think it will be done before we go out for summer break. Uh, good afternoon, Congresswoman. We can applaud for it before the summer break. <laughs> Vicki Ward is my name. Hi, Vicki. I, um, have a question uh, relating to this, the income disparity that you pointed out. Uh, watching what has been going on recently, particularly with the uh, frustration of the uh, Republican Tea Party in the House uh, preventing anything from getting passed, not only jobs bills, but uh, the education that you mentioned with the sequester head start being cut. Could you please ask the question? Yes. We do that? Um, Sorry. Given this situation with the few that seem to frustrate the situation, I noticed when you were the speaker, you were able to get the uh, health care bill passed through compromise and so forth. Do you see? us being able to get anything accomplished within the next uh, three years, uh, the way things are going, particularly this next election, uh, the gerrymandering, the financing of uh, these Tea Partiers with the Koch brothers' money and so forth. Well, thank you for your question. I can be brief on this. Elections have ramifications. And uh, so we would like to debate the issues and hopefully encourage our colleagues to at least try to find common ground. If we don't, the American people will speak in the year 2014 on this subject. And I, I tell you this, if you put bipartisan cooperation on the, on the ballot, it would get the most votes of anything. And that is what is at stake. They just, no civility, no bipartisan cooperation, no nothing. And, and uh, that's one thing we'd like to see restored uh, so that this president can have his proper legacy. We gave him a big chunk in the two years we were there. The only reason we were able to pass the Violence Against Women Act recently, which is 500 days overdue, was because we made the issue too hot to handle right. in the public. President Lincoln, public sentiment is everything. Take it to the public. So I think you'll, the accomplishments will depend on how well the public know, uh, um, and the public is wise and the public is brilliant, but the, we just have to make sure they know what the choice is. 
So the election, I think, what, what, that's a year and a half off, and we don't want to wait that long to make real change. So hopefully public sentiment will prevail. Next question over there. Um, Ms. Belosi, thank you for coming to Cleveland. We really okay. appreciate your honesty, yeah. directness, and caring. Uh, it comes through so strongly. Um, my question is a little different. It's related to the fact that wars divert money from the issues that you care so much about. And there have been resolutions in the House and Senate uh, saying that if Israel attacked Iran, that the United States should uh, actually support Israel. But there have been no studies commissioned by Congress that talk about what this would cost us mm -hmm. in terms of lives, treasure, how long it would go on, what would be the worst case scenario. Don't you think, would you agree uh, that Congress should commission such studies as soon as possible, since there are so many of these kinds of resolutions cooking along, to estimate both the best and the worst outcomes of an American involvement in a war with Iran? Well, I appreciate your question, and I would take it to the bigger issue about American involvement in war, period, which has to be one of the most obsolete uh, means of conflict resolution that still prevails, that we would go to war and start killing people. You see what's happening in Syria and the rest. And another cost of war is not just the cost of war, is the cost of our veterans. Marcy, Marcy Capture, Sherrod Brown, uh, uh, Tim Ryan, and, and uh, Mary Rose, when she was there, Marsha Fudge, uh, Be uh, Joyce Beatty, are all committed uh, to having a priority of taking care of our veterans. In the military, they say, uh, we will not, on the battlefield, we leave no soldier behind. We say, and when they come home, we leave no veteran behind. But it's hard. Imagine, people are criticizing what's happening with the veterans, and we have to do better. But we have a million and a half more veterans because of a war that started 10 years ago in Iraq that was unnecessary, predicated on a false premise, lost all of these precious lives, wounded so many others, and, and uh, did not set aside a way to financially accommodate the needs of all the veterans who would be coming out. So yeah, we should have commissions that recognize the cost of war and what it means to veterans and their families after that. And when I just told you, I got off the phone with Pres uh, uh, Secretary mm -hmm. Kerry, and he, uh, you know, he was telling me what was happening vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, which I have visited uh, Pyongyang. Not many members have, have been there. It's a, it's a terrible place and a very unreliable leadership. But central to both of the issues, what I mentioned in North Korea and what you mentioned in Iran is the development of nuclear weapons. We should have a policy that rids the earth of all nuclear weapons. That was, that was General Carter in his inaugural address. That was Ronald Reagan at Reykjavik. This is not a radical idea. And so when there's this threat of something like a nuclear weapon that can cause horrible destruction, yes, it has a return address. Yes, they will pay a price. But so what good is that? So if we can get more fundamental to say we are not going to be uh, held hostage uh, to mad people, uh, uh, and, and I do think that's probably an accurate description of what is happening in, in, uh, uh, in North Korea. So yes, thank you for your thoughtfulness about what, hey, I, mean, I have to say this because this war, what is it going to cost, $2 trillion, the 10-year war plus going in, uh, into Iraq instead of staying put in Afghanistan, getting the job done, just divert attention, go to Iraq. So all the extension of all that cost of force, unpaid for, no, nothing, all paid, heaping on the, so we have tax cuts for the rich, two unpaid for wars, give away t uh, breaks for the pharmaceutical industry in a prescription drug bill that they passed, and then they say, what are you gonna do about your deficit, President Obama? And by the way, don't tax the rich and, and don't lift up income of, of middle-income people so that more revenue comes into the Treasury by creating jobs and keeping them in America. I mean, this is, this is really something, and that's why we have to, with just a few clear points, make sure the public knows what is at stake 
uh, in these elections, when they start talking deficit, 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 they didn't, the deficit hawks didn't say boo, hoot, what does a hawk say? Who? They didn't say anything, <laughs> right? For the eight years that President Bush was heaping up this debt, after being in a trajectory of going into, the last four or five budgets of President Clinton were in balance or in surplus. We were on a trajectory of reduce, uh, ending the deficit. And they turned it around, and now they want to know what's going to happen with President Obama and his, his deficit. But anyway, Over there. I digress. <laughs> <laughs> It's been wonderful to be able to listen to the real Nancy Pelosi Thank after you. all those scary ads. <laughs> they used some of my best photos. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think, uh, especially for the women here, we feel like we're touching history. Uh, for my, my question is, do you have any uh, personal thoughts that came to mind uh, after the passing of Margaret Thatcher? That's a good question. Hmm. It was quite a remarkable thing that a woman was able uh, to rise to power uh, in the United King in the UK, as, as we call it, in, in Great Britain. Uh, it, people had been used to uh, a monarch who was a queen, so maybe that made a little the path a little easier. But nonetheless, the legislative branch, the, even though this is a parliamentary system, is a um, is a tough arena. And so just succeeding to become the prime minister is quite an accomplishment. It speaks to her strength, to the power of ideas, which I mostly disagree with. But that doesn't mean I don't uh, uh, respect the, the way she presented them, how successful she was in getting them across. And uh, it's interesting to watch the reaction in, in Britain on her passing, too. So um, I want to, but since you asked about women in of that. I, if I may, Connie, I'm going Please. to digress again. That's all right. Here, I need your help on this because we talked about you know, Social Security, a pillar of uh, uh, stability, economic stability for America's family. Health, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, another pillar of health security. Affordable Care Act, another pillar. We put it in that league as making a difference. The th what we have to do, and, and uh, not necessarily as, uh, shall we say, um, transformative as Social Security, Medicare, and Affordable Care Act for everybody, but I think for uh, very important to our country is to have affordable, quality child care for all of America's children. If we are going to unleash, unleash all that women have to offer, we have to really get to this point. We had, uh, 100 years ago, this year, a march on Washington, women's suffragette, uh, the women's suffragettes for, for women's right to vote. A few years later, the headline said, women given the right to vote. Given? No, I don't think so. I think they fought really hard. They marched. They had problems within their own families. They were courageous. They went out and fought. And anyway, women achieved the right to vote. Then during World War II, we had the full employment, uh, not the full employment, we had the employment of women outside the home uh, on the war effort. And that was a big thing. Now women are leaving home to go to work in the factories for the war effort. And then we had, well, after the war, the higher education of women, not all, but many women, women into the professions, but women having choices and some economic uh, necessity uh, to work. But what was the missing link in all of this was uh, affordable quality child care for women and for men, for families. And I, it, was, it passed the Congress. It was on President Nixon's desk. People thought he was going to sign it. And then a uh, uh, conservative movement, uh, really, conserv really more than conservative movement, came in and said that that, wouldn't, that would undermine families or some word. You can just imagine what they said. And so he, did, he vetoed the bill. Now, that was a long time ago, 40 years ago. It's long overdue that we would have this. Now, the president comes close in his budget when he says preschool for all, because we have a situation of children learning, parents earning. 
women have the confidence that they can go to work, that their kids are provided. Because everything comes down to what we started this conversation with, jobs. It's about jobs and job opportunity for everyone. And to, again, to get the fullest contribution intellectually in, in every way from women. Uh, and we need to have uh, the, uh, make sure the kids are taken care of in a very learning uh, environment. So I, I need your help on that. So anybody who's interested in that, let me know. Okay. On, on this day of, uh, this, uh, this was our last question. And uh, before we bring the program to a close, since we are having this merger of uh, celebration of free speech and notable women in the world, I do want to acknowledge that the Plain Dealer editor is here today, Deborah Adam Simmons. And I want to ask all of you, I am assuming all of you do, but in case there's one of, or two of you who don't, please subscribe to The Plain Dealer and support The Plain Dealer in this tremendous time of challenge and transition. Thank you, everyone. Jan? Today at the City Club, we have been listening to a special forum featuring Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi, U.S. Representative for California's 12th District. Thank you very much, Leader Pelosi. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. <laughs>